Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Space Society's 31st Annual International Space Development Conference. My name is Paul Danfus. I'm the Executive Director of the National Space Society. And on behalf of the members, chapters, supporters, and leadership of the NSS, I'd like to express our sincere thanks to all of you for participating in what we feel will be the best ISDC in years. This year, we have an outstanding lineup of speakers and topics from industry, government, academia, and the new commercial space sector, and from you, the public, and our members of the NSS. The NSS is an independent educational nonprofit organization dedicated to the creation of a spacefaring civilization. Simply stated, our vision is that of people living and working in thriving communities off the Earth and using the vast resources of space for the betterment of humanity. NSS is widely acknowledged as the preeminent citizen's voice in space, and we proudly boast thousands of members and supporters in over 50 chapters in the United States and around the world. The Society also publishes Ad Astra magazine, an award-winning periodical chronicling the most important developments in space. And as you'll see over the next few days, our International Space Development Conference is the premier forum for the space advocacy community. Now, it should also be noted that the NSS was originally founded as the National Space Institute, first led by Werner von Braun in 1974, and the L5 Society, inspired by Gerard O'Neill in 1975. The two organizations merged to form what's today's National Space Society in 1987. And if you look in your program book, there's a copy of that merger proclamation. So this year is our anniversary, and while we will take time to reflect on where we've been, we'll do so with an eye towards where we are today and where we are going tomorrow, more importantly. And from where I sit, I can't think of a more exciting time for our future in space. Now, while we face many challenges, not the least of which is moving forward in a highly constrained and uncertain budget environment, the opportunities for reaching our goals could not be greater than they are today. This morning's activities, as, you'll, as we were seeing earlier on the, uh, on the screen uh, with the uh, SpaceX Dragon vehicle at, uh, at the International Space Station, uh, is just one example of, of this excitement. And uh, we would really like to send our sincere congratulations to Elon uh, and the entire SpaceX team for what's looking like will be a successful uh, COTS two and three missions. Um, yes, please. But you know, in, in addition to that, it's not just about the mission, but it's also about having that vision and pursuing that vision, and pursuing it even when it seems difficult. And uh, Elon and his team are to be commended for that. Right now, real companies are building real hardware, not PowerPoint charts, not animations, real hardware. And many of them are actually flying now, including Mastin, Armadillo, Blue Origin, to name just a few. Virgin Galactic continues to pursue a vigorous test program, eventually leading to powered flight followed by suborbital flight. Sierra Nevada will soon begin a test program of their own for their Dream Chaser vehicle, which will hopefully lead to regular commercial crew transport to and from the International Space Station. Once achieved, the larger commercial crew program will lift the burden of servicing low Earth orbit from NASA, freeing up our national space program to focus on much more ambitious goals and opening up the new frontiers in space. So we'll hear more about Sierra Nevada's progress and about the broader commercial community from Sierra Nevada Space Systems Chairman Mark Serangelo during his talks today and tonight. And real funding is beginning to flow into the commercial sector. A new generation of savvy space entrepreneurs is bringing us closer to that tipping point where space will someday be accessible to us all. With the Google Lunar X Prize, nearly three dozen teams are competing for the largest prize in history and to ignite a new era in lunar exploration. Robotic sentinels continue to unlock the secrets of the universe around us. The Kepler spacecraft and its search for planets in orbiting stars in our neighborhood of the galaxy is bringing us tantalizingly close to that day when we will find other Earth-like planets. Closer to home, relatively speaking, the initial reconnaissance of the solar system 
is nearly complete as the New Horizons spacecraft speeds its way to a 2015 rendezvous at Pluto. And just a few weeks ago, the company Planetary Resources announced its plans to mine asteroids for profit and elicited a response from TV comedian John Stewart. He said, finally, a headline worthy of the year 2012. So we'll hear more about Planetary Resources from its co-founder and co-chairman Eric Anderson today at lunch in what I'm sure is going to be a very compelling talk. So it's a really, really cool time to be involved in space, and it's only going to get better. So we'll bring some of that excitement to you directly over these next four days. This year's conference theme is Onward, Upward, reflecting this positive energy surrounding space today. So in addition to the speakers that I've mentioned, we have a who's who of key people who are bringing this excitement to life. This afternoon, we will look deeper into the business side of things with the Space Investment Summit. And in conjunction with our partners, AIAA, we'll present the space settlement track in our space settlement design presentations. Tomorrow, we'll explore Mars, the asteroids, space ports, and space solar power. In a follow-up to his talk last year, ex core CEO Jeff Grayson will share his latest words of wisdom with us at tomorrow's dinner. Uh, if you saw his talk last year on space settlement, it, uh, it quickly went viral, and we're all excited about seeing his follow-up to that. Sunday, we're going to have talks uh, on the Google Lunar X Prize, Living in Space, and a special announcement from Excalibur Almaz. And Sunday morning, we have a very special event as we host an NSS Heritage panel where we reflect on the National Space Institute, the L5 Society, and the merger that brought them together to form the National Space Society. And we're really happy to be joined by many of the leaders from that time, including NASA Deputy Director, NASA Deputy Administrator and former Executive Director of the NSS, Ms. Lori Garver. Ms. Garver will also join us on Sunday night as we host our annual awards dinner. We'll wrap up on Monday with perhaps two of the most important topics, education and outreach. And education and outreach are two of the most important things we do at the NSS. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, are those topics that we encourage students to take on today to lead us into a brighter and stronger future. Now at this conference, we have over 300 students in attendance from around the world. And if I could ask the students to please stand up and, and be recognized. If you're a student, please, please stand up. And so, so how, many, how many students do we have from India? Where's India? There we are. How about uh, Romania? I know Romania has a big presence. There we are, Romania. Wow. Let's hear some other countries. Ireland. Ireland. Lovely. There we are. Where are U.S. students? Give us a big shout out. All right. Well, this is fantastic, and I would, I would encourage those of you who have been doing this for a while, who have been in the space community, and you have stories and, and wisdom to share, to find some of these young people in the next few days and, and, and share that wisdom and, and provide them with counsel. Uh, probably the single greatest uh, highlight of this year's conference will occur tonight at our gala and our annual governor's dinner. So we'll be moving just across the National Mall to the Air and Space Museum, where we'll present uh, Space Pioneer Awards for Lifetime Achievement to our guests of honor, Mercury astronauts John Glenn and Scott Carpenter. The evening's theme of standing on the shoulders of giants, we will look to honor these American heroes, but with an eye again toward the great things to come in space. It will be a truly spectacular event at a truly spectacular location. And we hope to see you all there. And if you haven't purchased a ticket, there are still some available. So get them while they are still available. See one of the, uh, one of the ISDC staff to, uh, to get yourself a ticket. And so rather than wait until the end of the, the, the conference, which I know that we normally do uh, when we're wrapping things up, and while I still have some semblance of your attention, I need to recognize the tremendous effort of the ISDC team for their, for their incredible effort for this year's conference. This year's conference chair is NSS's very own Senior Vice President and Senior Operating Officer, Josh Powers. Where is Josh? Josh is probably directing traffic out, out there somewhere. Um, so what, really what, what's remarkable about Josh is that 
he didn't actually take on this, this job until just a mere about four months ago. And he only had one requirement. He said, I want to have a strong staff supporting me. And I think that he'll probably agree with me that uh, that's exactly what he, he got. Uh, Debbie Cohen and Angela Pura, I don't know if they're in the room. I know they were up very, very late putting out fires. Um, they've proven that, uh, that you can pull a conference of this magnitude together in just under, uh, under five months. And, and the work really has been nothing short of, uh, of Herculean. Um, there is Josh, he just walked in the room. I thought they, they thought they'd put the lights in my eyes and I couldn't see him. Uh, I'd also like to uh, recognize our management services company, uh, John Flatley and Darcy Chuba, for their day-to-day -day support of our headquarters operations and for coming on board and pitching in with the ISDC team. And all the volunteers who have come together in the last several days to really help the conference take flight. Um, if you're a volunteer, can you please stand? Or most of the volunteers are probably out doing their, there's one of our volunteers here. There's some in the back. There we are, so uh, give them a, a round of applause. And I suspect she's probably not in the room either, but I really need to thank Tanisha Fortson, who's our membership services manager, and really uh, lately has been the jack of all trades. Uh, she's really the, the person who keeps the headquarters uh, operating smoothly and keeping our membership services running, running very smoothly, and she really keeps me out of trouble on a, on a daily basis. So uh, again, please uh, uh, help me uh, give these folks a, a round of applause for all of our volunteers. And staff. So again, if, if you see any of these folks, uh, pull them aside and give them uh, personal thanks. I'm sure that they'll appreciate it uh, very, very much. So it's now my distinct honor to introduce our opening keynote speaker, uh, the 12th NASA Administrator, Charles F. Bolden, Jr. As Administrator, he leads NASA's team and manages its resources to advance the agency's missions and goals. General Bolden's 34-year career with the U.S. Marine Corps included 14 years as a member of NASA's astronaut office. After joining the office in 1980, he traveled to orbit four times aboard the space shuttle between 1986 and 1994, commanding two of those missions. His flights included the deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope and the first joint U.S.-Russian shuttle mission, which featured a cosmonaut as a member of the crew. Now, I personally have had the pleasure of knowing General Bolin, not only in this capacity, but also during the time when we both wore the, the uniform of the U.S. Marine Corps and the wings of gold of a naval aviator. So our paths crossed a number of times over the years, but the one that stands out in my mind occurred uh, as I was assigned to the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit aboard the USS Pelo, uh, General Bolden came aboard to fly with our squadron, and after the evening meal in the, ward, in the ship's wardroom, uh, we had a very candid conversation. Uh, he, had, he had a very candid conversation with the uh, squadron's junior officers on leadership, service, and really believing in something that's, uh, that's larger, larger than yourself. And so I was one of those junior officers in the wardroom that night and came away with an even stronger degree of respect for General Bolden as a leader and as a man of principles. And so I consider myself very fortunate and honored uh, to introduce him today. So please join me in welcoming NASA Administrator General Charles F. Bolden, Jr. Colonel Damfus. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And I, uh, for those of you who are officially attached to NSS, you could not be in better hands uh, than having a Marine, particularly a Marine aviator, leading the charge. So uh, I feel really good about where you are. You know, it, it's great to be here um, at another International Space Development Conference. And, and I think, as has already been mentioned, your theme for this year, Onward and Upward, could not be more appropriate. Um, b before I do get into formal comments, I'd like to acknowledge, and he may have already been acknowledged, but you can never do it enough, uh, the presence of Buzz Aldrin sitting here on the front row messing with his, his lanyard there trying to figure out how to get it undone, but, uh, <laughs> but Buzz is a... <laughs> when you talk about uh, some of us standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, I don't need to, to tell any of you about uh, the giant status that he has in, in the space program, particularly in, in human spaceflight. You know, as we gather here this morning, and you, you've been watching it a little bit, uh, as we gather to talk about the future of exploration, 
Uh, hopefully all of you understand that that future is being devi defined even as we speak, and history is being made. Um, right now, SpaceX Dragon capsule is, join is joining itself to the uh, International Space Station. And for those of you who may have come in late and said, well, I thought this was going to happen at 810 or something like that, uh, I'll tell you a story uh, so, that, so that you understand what we're doing here. Um, you know, the birthing process is still underway, and the last note I got from Bill Gerstenmeyer who's in mission control down in Houston, the grapple should occur no earlier than 1040 this morning. Um, it's a cargo resupply mission that's, uh, that is actually two flights in one. It's the second and third dem demonstration flight for SpaceX. I think many of you know that and know the drill. Their first flight was in December uh, 2010 uh, when they became the first private company to launch a vehicle into space, orbit, safely return, and land intact. Uh, now, every milestone that they achieve is a first. So I, t I described to people when we were down in Florida for the launch earlier this week that um, this is an incredibly exciting and historic time for all of us because every evolution that they get behind them is, is history, uh, having been made. And uh, they're now about 30 meters away from station and holding and getting ready to, to let the crew bring them on in to the grapple point where... Um, uh, Don Pettit and um, will use the shuttle, the uh, shuttle, the station's arm to reach out, grab Dragon, and then pull it in and what we call berth it to the International Space Station. Um, it, it's truly a major milestone in President Obama's ambitious exploration plan, one that seeks to rely on private industry to take over transportation to low Earth orbit so that NASA can focus on the really hard stuff like sending humans to an asteroid and eventually to Mars. I said I was going to tell you a story because sometimes uh, it, someone will find something to be critical about. Guarantee it, okay? Uh, as, as, as historic and as, and as incredible as this feat is, guarantee it. We will see some negative report this afternoon about, you know, it was supposed to have happened at 810, and it didn't happen until 1040. Well, I, I, I'm going to tell you a story about my second flight in space on the space shuttle. And it was on the space shuttle Discovery, by the way, which is now out at the Smithsonian uh, Udva Hazi Center. Uh, I was a pilot for Lauren Shriver, who was the commander of what was then called STS-31. That doesn't mean anything to anybody, probably. Uh, but it was the Hubble Space Telescope deploy mission. And, uh, and it was fraught with adventure. Uh, we were scheduled to, to uh, unberth Hubble. Steve Hawley was the primary RMS operator. I was his backup. Very simple process. We had trained for this for uh, more than a year. Uh, we had a backup EVA ready in case we needed it, but of, of course we would not need it because everything was going to be really straightforward. And uh, Steve and I got there, and Steve checked out the arm, and Lauren and I put the vehicle in the proper position for deploy, and Steve reached in and grappled Hubble, and everything looked great, and we started lifting it out, and all of a sudden the things that we planned to have happen started coming unraveled. Because, you know, Hubble was huge, uh, weighed about 25,000 pounds. And it, if, you, if you stuck your hand, you could, you could get your fist into the payload bay between the Langeron and the sides of Hubble. That's how big it was. That, and that's all the room it had. And uh, with the first movement of the telescope, Steve and I noticed that the data said it was starting to, to swivel and can't. It wasn't coming straight out. And, and so Steve had to meticulously, continually adjust the arm as he brought Hubble out of the payload bay so we wouldn't bang it or do anything bad. And what was to have taken maybe 10 minutes ended up taking us almost an hour just, just to get it out of the payload bay. And we put it into the deploy position or the, in the pre-position where the ground team in, in Houston was going to deploy the solar arrays, combination of the team in Houston and team up at, at Goddard Space Flight Center. And um, so we began, the appendages began to come out, high gain antenna on both sides, great. Uh, solar array on one side, great. Solar array on the other side, not great. It got about 16 inches out and stopped. And uh, everybody's heart kind of went boom, 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 boom because that wasn't supposed to happen. And so for the next almost 10 hours of the day, uh, the team, this evolution was supposed to take less than an hour. 
um, a number of critical things that, that now you had to change your plan. This is where the plan is developed and perfected and then life happens. Uh, so really important things like do not fire jets on the orbiter while Hubble is on the end of the arm because we didn't want to do anything bad. Uh, well, now we're, we're out there just kind of, the, the orbiter's drifting for uh, an hour, two hours, getting out of attitude. We're starting to worry about, you know, temperatures on the telescope because everything was planned such that it would have the right amount of sunlight on it and everything. And uh, after several hours, the team said, okay, uh, we've got to maneuver because you can't just, just let the telescope sit out there and freeze. And so they went through a lot of analysis and decided that we could do some minor maneuvering to get the vehicle back in position, and we did that. And, and, and the, another part of the ground team, particularly at Goddard, kept trying to figure out what is wrong. This should not have happened. Well, the crew had been to uh, Bristol, England, to uh, British Aerospace, the, the makers of the solar arrays, and we had actually used their water table uh, to do a manual deploy of the solar arrays so we could manually get them all the way out, and, and you literally crank them out. Uh, so we knew how to do that. We were hoping we wouldn't have to do it because if you, if you went to a manual deploy, then it really messed up the telescope, and, and it would limit its life and a lot of other things. So we did not want to do it, but we knew that that's what it might come down to. So the flight control team said, okay, uh, get Bruce and Kathy ready. And, and I was the IV crewman, which means my job was to get them in their suits. So Bruce McCandless and Kathy Sullivan and I floated down into the mid-deck, uh, went into the airlock, broke out the, e the EMUs, the spacesuits, and started to dress them. And uh, we got them ready, we got them into the airlock, closed the airlock, and started to depressurize. And um, nothing, could not figure it out. And we were about five minutes away, the, the airlock was completely depressurized, and we were probably five minutes away from having Bruce and Kathy open the hatch and go outside to manually deploy the solar array. When, as I am told, I wasn't there, so I'm relating a story. This is many hands story, but it sounds good. A uh, young engineer at the Goddard Space Flight Center said, you know, um, I don't think we have a problem at all. I don't think we have a mechanical problem. There's a module in the telescope called a tension monitoring module, and it's put in there for the specific purpose to keep the solar arrays from ripping themselves apart if they meet some resistance. And I just think that you know, the tension monitoring module has, has gotten a bad one or a bad zero or something. If, if we can just override it, everything will be okay. To those of us in the vehicle, it sounded somewhat familiar, but it sounded absurd because Bruce McCandless had said that first thing in the morning when the solar array stuck. Bruce knew Hubble better than any human being, I think, because he had been in on the design and development and everything. And Bruce had said something about, you know, I wonder if the tension monitoring module's bad. And, we didn't take the time to ask Bruce because we figured, okay, Bruce is just, you know, he's just bragging. And so we didn't pay any attention to it. And so they said, well, we think we may have a problem with the tension monitoring module. We're going to do one thing here, and then we'll let you know what to do. And uh, sure enough, they changed a one to a zero uh, in op the tension monitoring module, and <laughs> the solar array deployed. And uh, they said, okay, get into attitude very quickly, get the telescope released, and, you know, we'll go on. And so we did that. We did not have time to get Bruce McCandless and Kathy out of the airlock. Uh, they had trained for more than two years for this event to be there with cameras and everything and see their baby, the Hubble Space Telescope, deployed, and they were in the airlock. And they couldn't see anything because there was a little bitty, you know, little bitty hole uh, looking out into the payload bay, and there's nothing in the payload bay because Hubble was gone. And so we deployed Hubble. Uh, we're jumping up and down, jumping. We weren't jumping. We were you know, who are and, and everything, and Bruce and Kathy are going, what's happening, what's happening? We were describing it to them. They were not happy, uh, to put it mildly. But I tell you that story because that's sort of like what happened this morning. You know, there is an, an incredibly elaborate plan that was put together by the SpaceX NASA team, and then life happened. And uh, very simply, I'll let the experts explain it to you later, but very simply, we have a lot of sensors on Dragon, uh, LiDAR, you know, uh, X-band, all kinds of stuff, and the two LiDAR sensors, uh, laser rangefinders, uh, in, in, in every once in a while started locking on to the Kibo, to the gym module. So uh, we had to figure that out, had to understand it. And so SpaceX has made some real-time changes to the field of view of the LiDAR, and everybody thinks that we're okay to go now. So some of you may be getting more information than I am, uh, but, but right now, 
if I don't talk too long, I'll, I'll be down and you'll get to see the grapple. So anyway, but, but I just wanted to tell you that story so that when, the, when those who are skeptics start to write stories tonight, uh, just tell them, okay, show me one NASA mission that went flawlessly. Um, STS-125, the final Hubble servicing mission, had back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back EVAs, five EVAs on consecutive days. Uh, none of us thought we could do that, uh, and yet we pulled it off, but it was not flawless. Uh, we had little things that happened all, all through that, but the key was the teamwork between the team on the ground and the team in the vehicle that solved problems as they arose and made things happen. And that's exactly what you're seeing happening today. There is no SpaceX team. There is no NASA team. Right now, today, it's an American team that's getting Dragon in position so that it can be grappled by an international crew, uh, not, not an American crew, by an international crew and birth to the International Space Station and, and further make history. And that's a big deal. So, um, so you all, hopefully you'll jump up. You can jump up and down here. Hopefully you will jump up and down and scream when it occurs within a few hours. You know, we've now transferred Discovery, the vehicle that I just talked about, to the Smithsonian. And, and we've sent Enterprise up to New York. And it's awaiting its move from, uh, from a hangar at, at JFK. You must be from New York. Are you really? Hey. Uh, we're criticized for sending Enterprise to New York, by the way. Uh, and people want to know, what the heck does New York have to do with space? And, uh, and I have to remind them periodically, tonight we will celebrate the 50th anniversary uh, of Scott Carpenter's return to Earth from space during, the, uh, during his mission. And guess where he was picked up and brought back home? USS Intrepid. So, you know, when people say, but what does New York have to do, uh, you know, Bethpage, Long Island, New York, where Grumman Aerospace was, and and the USS Intrepid that picked up American astronauts. So, eh, maybe not, but I think that connects them to the space program appropriately. Um, private industry control of access to low Earth orbit is rapidly becoming a reality. We continue to make tangible progress on the heavy lift rocket and the Orion crew exploration vehicle to take our astronauts to deep space. And our efforts at developing the many associated technologies is picking up steam. NASA is also making substantial and exciting progress in our Earth and space science missions, our space technology and innovation efforts, and in our aeronautics research. So, while our flagship program of 30 years now undertakes a new mission in museums to inspire the next generation of explorers, the space program remains very much a dynamic thing, a living history that we're creating every day. Today is, and I'm not overstating this, a day that will go down in history. After a vigorous public discussion, the debate about our direction is over, and we're moving strongly into implementing some very exciting plans, plans developed with bipartisan agreement between President Obama and a bipartisan leadership in the Congress. If you're still wondering if this new era is real, I think the SpaceX success this week should begin to dispel those notions. Our current plans call for orbital sciences to follow suit later this year with their Cygnus module launched on their Antares launch vehicle. Behind them are Dream Chaser, the CST-100, Liberty, and other innovative private industry candidates to carry our US astronauts to the ISS and other LEO destinations in the years to come. And I'm not gonna talk about it, but uh, I hope you paid attention to my other LEO destinations. I know there is another, so there's a session, I think it's later on today, or it may be tomorrow, but that actually talks about uh, the industry, you know, a space industry and what what makes that? And, and in, while you all are here, some of you need to focus on destinations uh, because we have a lot of launch vehicles, but launch vehicles don't make an industry. Uh, what's going to make this industry viable is destinations, places where people and scientists and experiments and other things can go and spend long periods of time in the microgravity environment of space. And aboard an international space station, or a vehicle that has a crew on it, that is not constant microgravity. Every time I get on a treadmill and exercise, I jiggle the vehicle. And if I have a protein crystal growth experiment or a material science experiment, I've agreed to that disturbance, but I'm not happy with it because I know that I don't have to be in that environment. So some of you, uh, and there are some, but some of you have to push for other destinations, places that have a quiescent state 
where somebody who's doing materials processing or protein crystal growth or anything like that can put an experiment for six months, a year or more, and, and not have to worry about some astronaut on a treadmill or a rowing machine or a bicycle or something else disturbing the microgravity environment. And I say that in all sincerity, so uh, pay attention. In fiscal year 2013, NASA plans for at least three flights delivering research and logistics hardware to the International Space Station by U.S. developed cargo delivery systems. As you've heard me say before, I'm committed to launching astronauts from American soil on spacecraft built by American companies. I use the term I, and, and I should not say that, but, but since I'm the voice of NASA, uh, I use the term I, but I mean NASA. NASA is committed to launching American astronauts from American soil on spacecraft built by American companies because we're a family. Uh, I don't even consider us a team, we're a family, and that's really big to us. NASA's FY13 budget provides the funding needed to bring our human space launches back home to the U.S. and get American companies transporting our astronauts once again. Right now, we're looking at proposals for our Commercial Crew Integrated Capability Initiative. With these proposals, we're asking industry to complete the design of a fully integrated commercial crew transportation system that consists of the spacecraft, launch vehicle, ground operations, and mission control. These proposals are going to lead to Space Act agreements for initial development and will advance our efforts to help NASA and the U.S. achieve safe, reliable, cost-effective human access to space. All of our commercial partners continue to work diligently and innovatively toward their milestones. Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne, which is supporting the Boeing Company during the development of its CST-100 spacecraft in NASA's commercial crew development uh, round two, completed mission duration hot fire test on a launch abort engine in March. Blue Origin has successfully tested the aerodynamic design of its next generation space vehicle in development, and the vehicle has completed a series of wind tunnel tests. Throughout the field, I've seen tangible examples like these. Another very important indicator of the future is that people still want to be astronauts. We had a record, a near record number of 6,300 applicants for the class of 2013. And the 2009 class is already well into training for the missions of the future. Their first stop is going to be the International Space Station, now coming into its own as a laboratory and techn technology test bed like no other. NASA's robotic refueling mission experiment aboard the ISS, for example, recently demonstrated remotely controlled robots, and specialized tools can perform precise satellite servicing tasks in space. We do great things on the International Space Station. More than 400 scientific studies were conducted on station last year in an array of disciplines, not just those related to human health. There are probably five to 10 investigations going on on any given day. These studies are proving helpful with everyday problems of people of all ages right here on Earth and are also applicable to astronauts on long space voyages. We're learning a lot about hum the human immune system inner ear response and balance, visual acuity changes, and bone density loss, for example. Some of this particular research is especially relevant to our senior population here on Earth. The call for advanced development proposals for the space launch system just closed. J2X pack, power pack tests of varying lengths are slated through the summer at the Stennis Space Center's A1 test stand to help us learn more about the upper stage. The Space Shuttle's RS-25D main engine inventory has been relocated to Stennis and Mississippi for use in the SLS core. I hope we have the opportunity to learn a lot from the SLS panel that's scheduled to be held later on today. Orion has been undergoing parachute drop and water tests, and thermal protection system work for the module continues at the Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. A Lockheed Martin-sponsored exploration flight of Orion will take place in 2014. That's two years from now, less than two years. With the first uncrewed NASA test flight of the integrated capsule and rocket scheduled for 2017. The 2014 flight will simulate about 80% of the speed of a lunar reentry and will tell us a lot about the thermal protection system and provide many other data points to buy down risk on Orion for NASA's flight. Our commitment to science remains strong. Although there has never been a time when there weren't more things on our wish list than we were able to pursue given our fiscal resources. But we'll be at Jupiter with Juno and Pluto 
with new horizons before you know it. Not to mention Dawn's flight to the dwarf planet Ceres, which will begin when it leaves the asteroid Vesta this summer. I hope you've seen the amazing results Dawn has continued to send us about Vesta itself. Much of this is unexpected data that will help inform our future missions to asteroids with humans. Information is still flowing in by the terabyte. And somebody told me the other day, are you sure you mean terabytes and not terabits? So I don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to ask somebody here, do I mean terabytes? Terabytes? Terabyte. Probably. I like that answer. Okay, well, I'm sticking with it. That's what's in the script. Information is still flowing in, in by the terabyte from Hubble, LRO, MRO, SDO, Cassini, Swift, Chandra, Fermi, and many others. Kepler is documenting an ever-increasing number of exoplanets, showing that our solar system is just one of countless others. The James Webb Space Telescope is being developed for launch in 2018. As the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, Webb will allow us to continue to revolutionize our understanding of the universe by peering across space and back in time to the formation of the first stars and galaxies. It recently reached a hardware milestone with completion of the backplane that will support the telescope's beryllium mirrors, instruments, and thermal control systems. The Mars rover, known as Curiosity, will land on Mars in August. There, it will demonstrate precise precision landing technology, enabling us to probe the mysteries of the red planet in unprecedented new ways. This mission is also an excellent example of the synergy we're trying to nurture between exploration and science, as the rover performs amazing research using the most sophisticated suite of tools we've ever been able to send to Mars. At the same time, we're also developing an integrated strategy to ensure that the next steps for Mars exploration will support science as well as human exploration goals and potentially take advantage of the 2018 to 2020 exploration window for Mars missions. In space technology, there are about a thousand projects developing the technologies we need for today, tomorrow's missions. In the nation's laboratories and test chambers, NASA is driving advances in high payoff space technologies and developing and maturing broadly applicable technology in areas such as in-space propulsion, robotics, space power systems, deep space communications, cryogenic fluid handling, and entry, descent, and landing, all of which are essential for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. The Space Technology Program has recently given out the second round of space technology fellowships to help us develop tomorrow's leaders and benefit from their work now. You should also know that we haven't forgotten the first A in NASA. In aeronautics, our investments are driving technology breakthroughs for cleaner, safer, more efficient aircraft. The millions of air travelers around the world will benefit from our work and our partnership with the greater aviation community to transform our air travel system. We're accelerating the nation's transition to the next generation air transportation system, or next gen, and making commercial aviation safer, more fuel efficient, quieter, and more environmentally friendly through investments in revolutionary concepts for air vehicles and air traffic management. So with the retirement of the shuttle, NASA is not only still in business, we're pushing the envelope of current capabilities and bringing new ones to life. You can do a lot with a $17.7 billion budget request we have for FY13, and we will and we are. Our budget is stable, and while some tough decisions had to be made, that's true for everyone these days, from government agencies to households. I believe we have the right balance to accomplish great things now and into the future. I believe that the best is yet to come. Our bigger dreams are just starting to come to fruition. At its core, NASA is more than ever about American innovation and American ingenuity. I want to stop a minute. Students, stand up again. Please, look around those of you who are older than students. <laughs> Look around at this group. This is our future. And they are from all over the world. And they believe that we are going to do the things that we have been talking about for decades. Thank you all very much. But that is the future.
you know, this is all about keeping the U.S. the world leader in space exploration, and not, not for any bragging rights or anything, but it's because our international partners expect us to be the leaders. They expect us to maintain our leadership. Uh, they look to us to be the leaders in this venture. Um, you know, if you have a, an effort and there is no leader, then you're going nowhere. Uh, and the international partners really depend on us uh, to get this done. So we cannot disappoint. I really believe this is going to be an amazing ride. Uh, you know, the future is literally happening right now, and NASA intends to lead the march to it. I hope most of you share my enthusiasm and you're willing to join us in this great adventure. Uh, I've, I thank you very much again for allowing me to be with you this morning. I've enjoyed it. Um, I think I have time to take a few questions if some of you have them, so we'll give it a shot, see how it works. But thank you all very much. I believe we have uh, several microphones around the, uh, the auditorium, so if you want to queue up for, for questions, um, sir, I'll take the first one. Thank you very much for that, that speech and for your leadership uh, uh, as we move forward into the future. Um, at a recent Senate hearing, uh, it really struck me on something that you said about the, about the Dragon vehicle. And can we pull that image back up? Okay, we're getting really, really close. Um, and that's a perfect setting for, for the question. And for what General Bolden said at, at the Senate hearing, and, 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 and the, the gravitas of, of, of what's about to happen, when Dragon is grappled, brought into the station, berthed, locked in place, and the hatch is open, you said that those two spacecraft become one, and they start sharing them, moments of inertia and atmosphere. And I was wondering if you could just expand upon yeah. that a little bit for us. I, I will, very simply. You know, when we, when we connect, uh, just as we always do, no matter what the vehicle is, when we connect Dragon to the International Space Station and the crew verifies the pressures on, on both sides of the hatch are equal so that we can open the hatch, and they open the hatch, uh, the breathing air is the same. I mean, it's, it's, it's one support system, and, uh, and that's really, really, really important. And for the week or so that Dragon is going to be birthed to the International Space Station, our crew members will be going in and out just as if it were another module on station. So it is, you know, it stops being uh, SpaceX's Dragon module for a week, and it becomes just another part of the International Space Station. And, and you really need to grasp that, because that's really, really, really important. You know, we get a lot of, uh, I won't call it, I won't, I won't say that. We, get a, we have a lot of detractors. Um, who really won't let go of progress and, and the fact that history is being made today. And, you know, while not the same as man's first footsteps on the moon, this is an incredibly historic milestone. And it sets the, whole, it sets the tone for a new path uh, on which the U.S. and our international partners are venturing when NASA doesn't have to spend its time and its valuable assets on providing access to low-Earth orbit. That's what American industry is going to do. And I think you will see over time, not just American industry, but, but industry from other nations. And that's what we're looking for. So thanks very much. Oh, all right. Capture's confirmed. I was just told. Thank you. Question. There's a possibility of a uh, sequestration later on in the year. How would that affect NASA plans and programs? Would it be an across-the-board cut, or, or would you have to cancel specific programs? You know, we, we really haven't taken the, the, the time to spend a lot of... We don't spend a lot of time analyzing what the result of sequestration would be. That, that's what we've been told as a part of the administration, to just move along with the plans as we have them, work on what we hope to do with the 2012 budget when it's finally settled, and, and if sequestration comes, which we all are hoping that the Congress and the administration, you know, everybody, reasonable people can agree, uh, then we won't have to do that. But as it's set up, sequestration is, is supposed to be across the board cuts across the federal government. So I don't need to tell you what that would mean, you know, in terms of many of the programs that we have. But, but we are not planning for sequestration. We are not, uh, you know, we're not developing alternative plans for the budget or any of that kind of stuff. Okay. We're being Bolden's eternal optimist. 
a question about the terrestrial planet finder. I've been out of the loop for a while. Uh, what is the status? Is that still operational? And a little bit about the astrobiology program. Okay, and t t I'm sorry, I'm, for some reason I was looking at my coffee cup and I missed your very first statement. You were saying question about... Question about the terrestrial planet finder. That was the TPF that was going to look at um, extrasolar atmospheres. Yeah. Is that still online? And a little bit about astrobiology, future in NASA? Yeah, let me, t I, I can talk a little bit to astrobiology, but I, I'm going to have to, where's, uh, let me find out about the terrestrial planet guide. planet guide, okay, because I don't know, but, but we'll find out for you real quick. Uh, astrobiology, the, the primary, uh, there we go, I was premature in my, in my assessment, the, the feed, or the, the feed is delayed, okay. See, that's what happens when you look at pictures. You have to listen to what people are telling you. Um, I think many of you may know that, that our center for, for astrobiology, although we do it a number of places in NASA, the real focus is at the Ames Research Center. And, and I've had an opportunity to, to go out there and visit the astrobiology lab, and there is some absolutely incredible work going on. When you talk about sending humans to Mars, for example, uh, food, construction material, all those kinds of things, uh, if you're talking about weight, you're trying to get it down. Uh, some of the more elaborate areas of astrobiologic astrobiolo research right now are producing food from microbes, producing building material from microbes. They actually showed me uh, some microbes that they're using to, to, to build, to, to make concrete. And you know, when they test it uh, against Portland cement, I guess that's the gold standard. Uh, it is as strong as, as cement samples that we've gotten from, from the, the major cement makers here in the United States. So the future is, astrobiology is playing a critical role in that. Okay? I noticed that President Obama has set a goal of us going to the asteroid, of sending a manned mission to an asteroid in 2035, which obviously is about uh, 23 years from now. Isn't that a little bit underwhelming? And I have the impression that uh, it'll probably be canceled. And then uh, uh, there'll be no, no goal after that. Instead, shouldn't we go to Mars, like maybe follow Robert Zubrin's plan to, plan to Mars or something uh, more ambitious? Well, it's actually 2025, and we don't have an asteroid identified yet. So can't go to one until you identify it. It's very difficult to find an, I mean, I know it sounds, it, it, it sounds, okay, we eat piece of cake. Uh, we've got to do several things. We have to identify and characterize an asteroid that's bigger than your rocket ship. Uh, and right now, you know, there are a number, a very small number of candidates that will be available in 2025. The other thing about an asteroid mission, unlike going to a planet, is, um, you know, if, if you pick an asteroid that's going to be in your window for a short period of time and you miss it, then you've missed it. And, and you know, there's no, okay, we'll hold and wait until it comes back around on its next orbit. Uh, we're not going to do that. So I don't think it's underwhelming to say 2025 for an asteroid. Uh, going directly to Mars would be nice if we knew how to do that. Uh, we don't have the capability to do it just yet. And there are other nations that think that we should go other places before Mars. Our, our ultimate goal, stated by President Obama, is not Mars in the 2030s. And that's why you see the heavy lift launch vehicle. That's why you see commercial crew. All of this is, is our milestones on the road to getting humans to Mars by 2030. Yeah. Also, uh, if we go to an asteroid, what are we going to do there uh, except... Uh, if we, we're not going to exploit it, and also... Well, I'd, I'd ask you to talk to the guys from, uh, you know, who are, who are talking about mining asteroids, and I don't, look, I don't, I don't second guess anybody. I, I try to facilitate the success of, of, of entrepreneurs and people who dream big dreams, and people who talk about mining asteroids, I, I think they would probably want to discuss it with you. I, I, but I'm not, you know, I'm not the one to do that. Hello, Dr. Bolden. What can a grassroots volunteer education and advocacy organization like the National Space Society do to best, to best help NASA achieve our mutual goals? You know, I think um, it, it, your base, one of your basic uh, goals and objectives is the fostering of, of STEM education and the like. And that we, you know, we have technical challenges with going to space. 
we have a major societal challenge in, in solving the puzzle of how to get our kids interested in science and math and engineering and, and, and maintain that interest and be able to track them so that we know which programs are successful and which ones we should shed. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't have very good metrics right now. I, I can tell you about NASA for which of our programs are successful in reaching kids and bringing them to STEM-related uh, jobs, if you will. So the work that NSS is doing, I think, is key. Uh, collaboration with other uh, nonprofit organizations that are doing the same kind of thing, plus American industry. Uh, you know, we talk to industry quite a bit now about our STEM initiatives, trying to collaborate wherever possible because they're just, you know, they're limited funds for everything. And, and you frequently find that the first thing that gets cut is education. Uh, wrong. You know, I, I don't think that's the right tack to take, but it's very easy for people to target funding for education and say, we'll get around to it when we can. Uh, we need to get around to it right now. So I would say the work that you're doing is key. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, good morning, General Bolden. Um, you mentioned earlier during your talk about being an optimist or being optimistic. So I have an optimistic question to ask, um, especially in the light of the birthing going on here with the um, Dragon capsule. Is it possible or are there any plans for um, an acceleration of commercial space flight activities uh, based on this success that we're all looking at now and based on the plans with, um, with the competitors, basically, of, of SpaceX? Um, are there any plans to have uh, crewed uh, capsules going to ISS sooner than possibly 2017, 2016, um, if, if these successes continue? That actually depends on the ability of the, commercial, of the private companies to get through the development process with their vehicles. We've set, and, and we've, we've taken a guess, a swag. We've set 2017 as the operational ready date for commercial crew because NASA's budget says if we do the support that we think we can do, then this is technically where we think companies will be when, when they're able to provide support for crew. Some companies are saying they're going to be ready. Some companies are saying they'll be ready two years earlier. You know, if that happens, then, then that's great. But right now, based on, our fund, on NASA's funding alone, uh, as, a, as an investor, if you will, we see 2017 as the date. That's too long, I admit, much too long. But that's where we are based on the congressional funding, the congressional level of funding. It, you know, if you remember, um, and, and we do have to, we continue to work with, with Congress. And, and, and I will say the bipartisan support that we have gotten and continue to get uh, in this day and age is incredible. Um, you know, everybody wants NASA to be successful. Everybody wants the private industry to be successful, in spite of what you may hear and what you may think. It's just that everybody's not the same, not a believer at the same level just yet. After today, uh, I think you're going to find that there are many more believers than there were an hour ago. Uh, because, and it's, and it's, think about it, okay? At NASA, I, I tell our family, look, folk, let's plan well and then let's execute. If we deliver things on time and on cost, people will believe what we say. The reason that, that we're struggling right now is, is because prior to this administration, um, you know, we were not getting the funded re funding requested and we were not able to deliver on time and on cost. Anytime you, you get less money for something than you forecast needing, a couple of things happen. Either you stretch it, which means it gets more expensive. You know, it never gets cheaper never gets cheaper by, by taking off the funding, contrary to what some people may think. So I think we're, I think we're on the right path. Uh, 2017 is a conservative estimate. Uh, depending on how, how uh, industry performs, we could, we could be quicker. Yeah. I keep my fingers crossed. Thank you. Okay. First of all, can we get one more round of applause for this successful grappling? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. My question for you, Mr. Bolden, thank you very much, is um, you were talking about how the uh, uh, contracts for the SLS were closed. Um, have, has NASA selected uh, someone that could possibly be doing liquid 
rocket boosters instead of the solids, or is that something that might be looked at in the future? No, I, I, I didn't. If I said that, I was in, in error. I did, I did not intend to say contracts were closed. I said work on the SLS and Orion continues. Uh, you know, we have a prime contractor for Orion. That's Lockheed Martin. That's been settled. Uh, while we have prime contractors involved in aspects of the space launch system, we still have a number of things that, that are open. Uh, advanced boosters that are going to take us to a 120, 130 metric ton vehicle. When we launch SLS in 2017, um, then it's going to be with the existing five segment solid rocket motor provided original, uh, originally intended for shuttle. Uh, it will have shuttle main engines that have been modified uh, to be the core for a liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen main propulsion system. And, um, and, and then, you know, the structure itself will be what we have today. Uh, you'll have stainless steel tankage and the like. When we go to Mars or when we go to places beyond low Earth orbit uh, in the future with humans, ideally we're going to have composite tanks. We're going to have a lot of different components that are much lighter and more resi resilient than what we have today. That's, that's the source of our, or that's the purpose of our technology development program. And that when I tell people that the, the Space Launch System is an evolving system, it is not something, what we're used to in the past in NASA is we decide on a design, set the architecture, and we go with it. And 10 years later, you end up with a vehicle that's 10 years old, uh, and it hasn't even flown. Uh, shuttle was that way, to be quite honest. We, you know, we, we made an upgrade to shuttle when I was still in the astronaut office of inertial measurement units. We took some from the B-1 bomber that were going to offload the general purpose computers in terms of navigation computations and the like found out that the architecture was so rigid that you, you would have had to design the software package on shuttle completely to be able to accommodate the new inertial measurement unit. So, so we could not do what we wanted to be able to do. What we've said with, with SLS is we want it to be open architecture to the greatest extent possible. So software decisions probably won't be made until a year out or months out or whatever. It'll be like SpaceX. You know, we, some of you know that SpaceX slid because they made some late uh, software modifications to their Rendezvous Proxop software, which, which incredible flexibility. NASA's not quite ready to do that yet as, as flexibly as industry is. And so it took us a while. You know, I, I, people need to understand this is a team. So, you know, SpaceX's name was in the spotlight, but every once in a while some of the delays were delays that, that we had to impart because we were trying to catch up in some cases. It's an incredible team when you watch them. I mean, just sitting on the net this morning listening to the decisions being made real time, how do we deal with these things we're seeing? How, are we, how do you deal with life when it occurs? We had a great plan, but, but things happened that were not anticipated. But in, in going through what are the failure modes that can occur in your planning, the team said, okay, we think we understand this. Here's what we need to do. And, and the first back out, the first reversal came from space, came from Hawthorne. SpaceX said, we don't like what we're seeing, we're opening. And uh, that was, you know, they informed Mission Control that, hey, we're going to stop and we're going to back out a little bit because we see something that, that we don't like. Um, that's great. That's what you want. That's what you want the team to do. And that's what they did. I, I want to thank you all very much for allowing me to spend this time with you. And, um, you know, hopefully you're as excited as I am. I, I mean, we are... We are, the future is incredibly bright for us, and uh, we just have to stick to it and, and be resilient and, and, you know, don't give up because we're doing okay. Thanks very much. Sir, so thank you. If you could all take your... Please. Hey, <laughs> So we'd like to uh, present to you this, uh, this small token of our appreciation. It says, presented at the 31st Annual International Space Development Conference, Washington, D.C., May 24 through 28. And if you look at it very closely, you see the Earth surrounded by the moon and Mars, and fittingly for today, the International Space Station. So please accept that honor. Yeah, Thank, you, sir. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. you want to take a picture of you here? Five seconds, I'm going to get a board stage and engine arm.
You're going to get three seats, right? And that's all. 